for listening to Uncle Sam's Soccer Podcast, keeping you up to date with the latest in American soccer. And don't forget to subscribe. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Uncle Sam's Soccer Podcast. I'm Jake Watroba, and joining me today is Armand Kafai and Joseph Lowry of The Athletic. Steven Jodoran has the night off as he celebrates his birthday, so make sure you wish him a happy birthday on Twitter, at UncSamSoccerPod, or at Steven Jodoran. On today's show, Joseph helps us put a bow on the U.S. Men's National Team's international break, as well as provide us his thoughts on the team and Greg Berhalter moving forward. You can follow the show on Twitter at UncSamSoccerPod. We always enjoy your feedback and comments, so continue to send them in. Please make sure you rate, review, and subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. Now, let's get to today's show. Fellas, how you guys doing tonight? I'm doing good. Uh, I'm sweating a little bit in my grandparents upstairs, you know, getting that little Texas heat in my system. But, you know, we're, we're living. We're doing well. Joseph, how are you? I'm doing, doing well. well. I'm, I'm in an air-conditioned building, so I'm doing better than you are, I guess. Uh, joke's on you. I'm doing it so I can uh, clear my pores and look good for the weekend when I hit the club. Oh, man, you so. got me. All right, you got me, Armand. So, so. Well, there you have it. All right, listeners, <laughs> we have Joseph Lowry of The Athletic on the show And we're going to do a little deep dive into the U.S. men's national team following the latest international break that saw them lose to Mexico 3-0 and then later draw to Uruguay 1-1. Joseph had posted an article on The Athletic Friday afternoon titled What the U.S. men's national team can do to be more dangerous in attack. And after reading it, I thought... Joseph seemed a little bit more positive about the national team than Stephen and I had, and to a lesser extent, Armand, who I think had his questions as well. And Joseph, let's, I want, I want to start with you. Talk me off the ledge. Oh man, talk you off the ledge. That's easier said than done, right? Uh, looking at those results from the international break that loss to Mexico was really hard to stomach. And then the 1-1 draw to Uruguay, I actually thought, on the whole, was was pretty much fine. Um, but I think it's fair to be critical of of the team's style of play. I think it's fair to be critical of the things that Berhalter's doing. But it's also, you know, sometimes I'm not sure how, how fruitful it is to have conversations about, like, the merit of Berhalter's ideology. Because, you know, he does seem, at least to me, he seems pretty committed to that. So we can talk about whether or not he should be committed to that. But but for right now, I think it, it's fair to focus on the fact that he he is committed to this style, and you know he's committed to seeing it grow with with the player pool that he has and the player pool that he'll start to inherit over the next couple of years. So I think unfortunately that that risks alienating alienating an entire fan base because you know fans want to win, and when you try to build out from the back against Mexico for an entire ninety minutes and you can barely advance the ball past midfield you know, fans are going to turn and they're not going to be patient like Berhalter wants. So I think the players seem to have bought in, or at least, you know, externally they seem to have bought in, and, and Berhalter is, is still just as committed to it as ever. So the the player aspect, I think, encourages me a little bit because they, they seem to see the value of what their the coaching staff is asking of them. But it's going to be a process, guys. I'm not going to pretend like it isn't. Uh, I don't know if Berhalter will get enough time to be able to fully implement what he wants or or if the players are actually good enough to do it. But I, I think it's a process that, that we're going to see improvement on over the next couple of international windows. That's interesting that, that you you said you're, you're unsure if he'll have enough time to implement this system or or enough time for these players to catch on. So are, do you believe? And Armand, we, we can even well, I'll ask open this up for you as well. Do either of you believe he gets through qualifiers? Oh, that's tough because I mean. We haven't even hit Nations League yet, and we don't know what's going to happen for qualifiers. But, again, I do have a, a little bit of questions, right? Like, you can try this style all you want, but if it gets to a point where you're in this hole, 
like Klinsman got the national team into and then you, you lose your first two games, I mean, I think then you're done, right? Like, I don't think he'll continue after, after that. I mean, it, it just depends. I'm not, it might be a little too early to answer that question, but it all depends on what Greg does. But And we honestly just don't know because we saw him, you know, adjust tactically. Okay, we're going to lump the ball down against Mexico in a Gold Cup final. And Henry Bushnell had a great article. I think me and Joseph both really liked it, where he talked about how the U.S. men's national team kind of overcorrected for that Mexico match in that match, uh, in that friendly uh, last week. So, look, I don't – I'm not sure if we can say that, but it, I, I kind of just don't know. I don't know about you, Joseph, but I kind of just – I just don't know. And, and I don't know either, but I do think you – know, here's what I think. I think if you – as a federation, as U.S. soccer, if you fire Berhalter before – it definitely before he gets to qualifying or even after a couple of bad results in qualifying, that, that looks almost as bad as the hiring process in the first place, right? I mean it took so long to bring Berhalter into the fold, you know, whatever the reasons for that were. The it's, fake you know, hiring took, process. The huh? fake hiring process, whatever you want to call it. We don't know. But it's – you know, that was a whole ordeal and firing him after you made it clear that he was the guy – the you know the tunnel vision that you had to hire Berhalter in the first place, you fire him after some rough results in meaningful competition. That's not a good look either, because it just makes you look even more incompetent, likely than you actually were in the first place. So, I don't know if Berhalter will make it through qualifying. I, I think I, I agree with Armand. It probably is a little too early to tell on that front. But uh, you know, it's it's tough because we are sort of in a cycle of of poor results and you know just maybe a little little silver linings that we're trying to grasp from the style of play that, that Brawler has implemented. Now, Joseph, we talked about this last week on the show, but interested in getting your take on this. Last week on Alexi Lawless's podcast, The State of the Union, he essentially stated, I'm not sure if you heard it, so it, um, I'll, I'll try to just paraphrase it for you real quick. He essentially had a hunch that he thought the focus for this national team wasn't on 2022 that it actually was on 2026 which the world cup will be held in mexico U- the u.s and canada for that year what are your takes on that that it, that alexi lalas essentially has a hunch that berhalter has been given you know seven eight years to kind of implement this system and to hopefully get this team you know, and top notch before uh, the, the the World Cup comes to North America. I think, obviously, this is just speculation on my part, but just looking at the the talent in the player pool, the age distribution of that talent, uh, you know, that's one half of this equation. The other half of the equation is is how difficult it is to implement the style of play that Berhalter wants, the the possession style, building from the back, all of those aspects, all of those individual phases of play. You know, if if you compare those two things together, if you compare talented players with that dominant offensive style, you know, you're looking at, at quality results. And so I, in my mind, it's hard to see both of those pieces of the puzzle coming together much before 2026. You know, as, as disappointing as that is as an American soccer consumer, it's, it's hard to see the U.S. national team being overly competitive in 2022. Could they make it to a World Cup and, and maybe even get out of the group? Sure, maybe. Would I expect them to get out of the group at a World Cup in 2022? Honestly, probably not. So, you know, a lot can change between now and then and, and between now and 2022 and 2022 and 2026. But I wouldn't shock me at all if, if Berhalter has sort of been given a gentleman's agreement to to be able to implement the process that he wants and the style that he wants over an extremely long period of time. I think from a federation perspective, that probably uh, pens them in a little bit too much and doesn't give the federation enough flexibility to sort of move as they see fit between now and then. But you know, from a neutral perspective, I can see the value in giving one manager sort of a little bit more security and freedom to implement the ideas that he wants and wait for the talent pool to catch up with it. Well, Joseph, I wanted to read an excerpt from your article uh, over the weekend on The Athletic uh, where you kind of talked about the style of play and how the U.S. can – or what the U.S. can do to improve their uh, attack. Uh, you, you said, right now the U.S. is trapped in soccer purgatory, unsure of how long they will be stuck in a cycle of turnovers and slow developing possession before reaching Berhalter's desired result. It's no secret that the American player pool is shallow. The fact 
has prompted many to question whether or not the U.S.'s players are talented enough to execute the technically challenging style of play that their manager demands from them. While it's a fair question, the answer may be irrelevant. Burhalter's in-game coaching choices have made it clear that he's not going to throw his desired system away just because there is a gulf in skill between his players and the world's elite. Now, Joseph, we talked about this a lot last week, but you mentioned Burhalter's in-game coaching choices. Uh, you know, they make it clear that he's not willing to throw the system away. But anyway, he did just that in the Gold Cup final. They didn't play out of the back at all in the Gold Cup final. They just hit long balls all, all day uh, until uh, Mexico, you know, got that goal and they lost 1-0. And I know it's only been a few matches. He's only been in charge for eight or nine months or so. But you look at the Gold Cup final, and then you look at what transpired last week, and it almost feels a little reminiscent of Klinsman in 2014, where he talked about playing this this more attack-minded game, getting out on the front foot, and then when the World Cup rolled around, he converted to a 4-4-2 diamond against better opponents. And I guess my question is, and you've kind of talked about it already, but you know, let's I want to get your take on it just in a little bit more detail. Is this team only capable of playing Burhalter style against lesser opponents? So there are a couple things I want to hit at in there. Uh, talking about the Gold Cup final, I'm not convinced, and, and I could be proven wrong on this, that it was Burhalter's decision to have his team play longer. I think from what I remember about that game and, and from what I remember reading, it was more the players kind of ad-libbing and, and realizing that they weren't capable themselves or they didn't believe that they could play through pressure. And so they started to look for more outlets. I, I'm happy to be proven wrong on that, but that's I think that's answers that part a little bit. So I think Berhalter's in-game you know coaching decisions still do sort of shine a light on the fact that he he wants to be diligent in sticking with that style. But as as far as the second half of that question, you know, is the team only capable of of playing this way against lesser opponents? I mean, right now it seems like that's the truth, right? Because we haven't seen the U.S play or, or be forced to build out against a high press against any you know against really any competitive a super competitive you know world you know class team other than mexico right so they've they faced mexico twice and and not been able to do it either time so will you know will Burhalter sort of pull a klinsman and have maybe more of more variation in his style and change approach based on the quality op- of the opposition i kind of I feel like the answer is no, because I think Berhalter is just so committed. He's so focused on installing these principles to his players, sort of taking his foot off the gas and, and teaching them something different to prepare for one game and then switching back and forth between multiple different ideas over the course of, you know, an international break or over a course of a tournament. I don't think that's necessarily in line with what he wants to do. In in a perfect world, you know, in FIFA, you could absolutely go from playing a four four two, you know, counter attacking style with Adams and McKenney in the middle, and Tim Weah and, and Josie Altidore up top in, in one in one week, and then you could go back to the four three three or you know three two two three, whatever shape he wants to use in possession and build from the back against a smaller island nation the next week. But I'm not sure that's quite feasible with the amount of time he has to teach at the international stage. So I'm a little bit skeptical about the potential to sort of adjust and go back and forth so much. I think what I'd rather see is smaller, finer adjustments to take advantage of of different pockets of space in in every game. So, you know, you can play a game with, with certain principles and a certain style of play and ideas, but each game is going to be a little bit different. The tactics of each game is going to look just different a tiny bit different based on the opposition and how their defensive shape, you know, looks. So I, you know, against Mexico, Berhalter talked after the fact about how, you know, maybe they didn't go quite long enough. He thought in the gold cup final, they went too long. And in, in this friendly, they didn't go quite long enough. They didn't hit the pocket of space between Mexico's back line and, and their midfield. So it's all about those little adjustments. And I, I think I'd rather see Berhalter make changes to his coaching in those areas to maybe take more advantage of those gaps rather than sort of overhaul his style based on the opposition. I, uh, I I don't know because I I look at I look at what you know Burhalter has done and I I completely understand like you want to build a foundation and a base and Joseph I think you are right that the players I think did ad lib uh, during during that match and realized oh hey we can't do this and like let's let's revert back to our excuse me our natural tendencies but overall I just I just I I think 
it's it's a very interesting hill to die on because he preaches the development of players. It, it, in my opinion, looking you know around, it's very hard for someone to develop players when they only have them for a certain amount of weeks of, at a time. It's not like he has the players all the time. He can work with them, you know, but it's not like he has them all the time. And you got a guy like Weston McKinney. Look at, you know, Shock on the way they play football. Okay, it's not the best. I expect him to come play as, you know, possession dominant, beautiful Barcelona tiki taka. I mean, obviously, I'm over exaggerating a little bit, but, you know, this more beautiful style of soccer. I mean, you can even look at a guy like Aaron Long, right? Red Bulls don't really play out of the back as much. They like skipping lines, playing long balls. And you're like, oh, hey, you need to play it short, do this. It goes against the grain of, you know, who they are. And I get it. You want to change that mentality of the U.S. player. But that has to come, I think, it, that, I don't think, that, that's an idea you can have with the national team. And hopefully it trickles down to everyone else. But that also has to come out, you know, playing at good clubs. Not playing in MLS even. I mean, there's some MLS teams that do, you know, go out and you know, say, hey, look, we do this, we do that. We can play with the ball, we can play without, uh, we can, you know, dominate possession like LAFC. But even then, like a lot of teams don't really play like you know the best uh, the the best the best football. And you, you, and you know, like the teams that we talk about that play great soccer, what Spain, Barcelona, and Real Madrid, two of them easily one of the best teams in the in the world. I mean, you can you can look across. I mean, again, an example like that I would use to you know compare the United States to is Iran because Iran doesn't have that good of technical quality around. They know they can't possess the ball as much. So what they do, they 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 stuck to themselves. They were a very composed group, a very organized group, and then they went out and you know hit the teams on on the counter and use their individual skill that way. Look, I mean, I don't think it's bad if the U.S. plays a certain style of way that's not like you know the most attractive uh, at at times. And it to me though, it is a little concerning because now that you mentioned you know the ad living, have we seen Berhalter make an adjustment in a big game, and would he? If this was a World Cup qualifier, and I'm sure he would, I'm genuinely sure he would, but I don't, we don't know, obviously. If the United States was trailing, needed a goal, paying on it back wasn't working, in a World Cup qualifier situation, you know, where they needed to win, would he adjust and be like, all right, guys, let's lump it forward? Or what? We don't know. I, I, and now you mentioned it, I don't think we know. I mean, Jake, what do you think? I, I think the only bit of evidence we might have is if we look at what he did with the Columbus crew and what the crew did in big playoff matches to know if he's willing to deviate from the plan and say, Hey, I need a goal here. This, you know, passing the ball on the midfield or holding the ball and, and making passes just to make passes isn't working. We need, we need to get the ball in dangerous areas. We need, we need to create chances. We need to get the ball forward. I, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, a good concern to raise there, Armand. And, well, I guess we'll have to, to wait and see if, if he ever does get to a meaningful game with this team. Um, I'm still not convinced they're going to qualify for 2022. Maybe that's a preposterous statement. You can let me know, Armand. You can let me know, Joseph, if you think that's crazy. Listeners, you can let us know. And listeners also, question of the day, at Unc Sam Soccer Pod, is the national team capable of playing the style of play Burhalter wants? You've heard from me. You've heard for, from Joseph. You've heard from Armand. Let us know on Twitter at Unc Sam Soccer Pod. But that's it for today's show. You can follow our special guest, Joseph Lowry of The Athletic at Joe and Cleats. You can follow Armand Kafai at Armand Kafai. And you can follow myself at Jake Watroba. Tomorrow, we're going to do a deep dive of MLS, LAFC versus the Philadelphia Union, Minnesota United RSL. Be on the lookout for that. For Joseph and Armand, I'm Jake. We'll talk to you guys tomorrow.